For the next part of our presentations, we are going to be having the Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education, Dr. Stephanie Baird, who is the Associate Vice Chancellor for Research, Planning, and Evaluation, and Dr. Rachel Bates, the Associate Vice Chancellor for Educational Partnerships, speak on the state of transfer in Oklahoma. I think we have a PowerPoint, um, if you can bring that up. <laughs> yeah, it's not this one, sorry. There we go. All right, well, thank you. Yes, I'm Dr. Stephanie Baird. Um, I'm fairly new to the Regents. I've been in my position since late July. And what we've prepared to talk to you about today is really just kind of a snapshot of transfer data in the state of Oklahoma, um, taking a look at where our students kind of start, where they end up, how they perform GPA. We're going to look at some other demographics with how do male and female transfer students perform in comparison of one another. And then my colleague, Dr. Bates, she's going to talk a little bit about some math pathways and remediation work that's not specific to transfer students, but is kind of part of this conversation that's related to student success and academic performance, especially um, in the shadow of COVID that we're all kind of living in. So um, tracking statewide transfer data, talking to you today, um, we're going to be looking at a cohort of students. We're specifically going to be looking at progression. And so what we mean by that is retention or graduation. Are the students retained in the state system of Oklahoma? Um, not necessarily, of course, at the, the school where they start, because we're talking about transfer students, but within the state and or graduation. So those are our two kind of definitions here for progression. We're comparing fall to fall transfer data, so not semester to semester. And our data here doesn't distinguish between among degree-seeking students. So when you look at if a student started as degree-seeking, if they were looking at an associate's degree initially, if they changed to a bachelor's program, we're not distinguishing among those. Today's data set, because we look at six-year progression, that's kind of our standard for finishing a degree from a four-year institution. We're looking at the fall 2016 first-time entering students. That cohort of students is 32,598 students. And I forgot to announce that the students are breaking out for their breakout session now. So any students, if you could please stand up. Um, Josh Taylor is standing in the back of the room. If you can follow him to your breakout sessions. Um, as we were looking at this data, we were looking at what was presented last year at this conference and just trying to look at up-to-date information. And um, we noticed that when we talked about transfer students last year, we didn't um, distinguish between first-time transfer students and students' total transfers, which would be students that transfer more than once. And so as we separated out that data this year, um, I've tried to kind of denote that difference throughout the presentation so that you can also see instances of total transfers, or as the literature would refer to it as swirlers, students who kind of transfer multiple times and swirl among different institutions. So we're going to start by looking at where are students transferring within our state system of higher education. Um, I hope that this PowerPoint is able to be shared with you later because I know there's a lot of names on this slide and it's probably tiny font. But we took a look at our two-year students and what four-year schools they transfer to to see the top three four-year schools that students transfer to from specific two-year schools. Um, so on our left, you have your originating institution. That's your two-year school where these students in this cohort started. And then you can see where they moved to. Um, and so not surprising, a lot of um, you know, OU and OSU are going to be um, first, second, and third on a lot of these lists. They're big institutions. That's where a lot of students, um, maybe that's their goal to transfer to a research one. Um, UCO is a big institution for transfer students, and so they are high on several of these lists as well, um, as is Northeastern State University. Something you'll see on these slides is that proximity definitely plays a role, that a lot of institutions are going to stay in the same part of the state, and so 
So where they transfer to, a lot of the time is going to be based on the region that their two-year school is in, and they will go to a four-year school that's nearby. That's not always the rule. Obviously, big institutions in the state or institutions that are very friendly to transfer students and make that process pretty uh, smooth, those are going to be high on these lists as well. This next slide talks about four-year students who choose to transfer to a two-year school because that happens as well. And so we have the same information here, this originating institutions on the left. These are our four-year schools. And then our first, second, and third kind of transfer um, institutions, two-year schools that these four-year students would transfer to. I think you see proximity show up here a lot more than in the previous slide. Um, for whatever reason, a student has started at a four-year institution and has decided to transfer to a two-year institution. Um, and of course, Tulsa Community College and Oklahoma City Community College are big ones on the list because they're large uh, metropolitan community colleges in the state. And then we also took a look at students who started at private institutions in the state um, to see where they transfer to if they choose to leave a private institution. And so um, we have a couple of private institutions that report their data to us at the state regents. And then we were able to track and see where they transfer to as well. And a lot of this is also related to proximity. Um, it could be academic programs. Cost could be a decision. Um, academic performance can always be part of a decision. And you'll see that as we talk about GPA as well. Um, we took a look with this cohort to see which institutions admitted the most transfer students overall. Um, and this is where we start to see some differences between first time transfer, just did a student transfer at all that was in this starting cohort, or how many total times did students in this cohort transfer. So taking a look at number of transfer students progressed, this is total transfers. So, so UCO is at the top of this list. A student could start at Oklahoma City Community College, they could transfer to UCO, they could transfer to Oklahoma State, and they could cr transfer back to UCO, and that would count as two transfers. So when we talk about total transfers, how many times did personnel at UCO look at the student's transcript, articulate the credits, help advise them into coursework? We know that that's the, that's, that transaction, for lack of a better word, happens for those staff members multiple times, even if the student had also been at UCO at a previous point in time. Um, but looking at just the numbers of those 32,000 students in this cohort, only 19 of those students were transfers. So again, that's 6,104 out of those 32 students. But if you're looking at the total number of transfers from this cohort, that's over 17,000. So that means, just dividing simple math, each of those 6,000 students transferred approximately three times. So that's where we're kind of differentiating so you have an idea um, of this swirler effect. Um, which institutions admitted the most out-of-state transfer students? Um, so on the top, we have kind of this first time transfer. Again, just those students who transferred the first time they transferred, where did they transfer to? But which one had the most number of transfers, total transfers? That's your table on the bottom. And so you can look and see that a lot of similar schools, their rankings move around a little bit. Numbers change, of course. First time is going to be smaller than total transfers because students may transfer to one institution more than one time. We looked at Oklahoma's Promise students. Again, this is based on that originating cohort. So if a student started with the Oklahoma's Promise as a recipient, um, that's kind of where they were flagged in this data. And you can see where those first time transfers were with that Oklahoma's Promise um, grant. And then total students that had Oklahoma's Promise that were transfers from this cohort as well, how they moved around. So just kind of interesting, I think, to see which institutions are serving a lot of transfer students, whether it's total, whether it's multiple transfers, those swirlers. Um, you see a lot of the same institutions on these lists. Um, if, you, if you are from those institutions and you don't know that, this is hopefully really good context to take back to your campuses and say, wow, we were number two on the list um, with this kind of student as transfer. We need to really make sure our programs are set up to help those students. So let's look at female and male students, kind of transfer rates in this cohort. Um, this, is, this table is looking both at those first time transfer students. So female is on the left, men are on the right. Um, the next slide I think shows that there are more female transfer students in this cohort than men. It's about 60% female, 40% male. Um, interestingly, UCO is the top of that first time female transfer list. Oklahoma State's at the top of that first time male transfer list. A lot of the same schools on both lists, just slightly different orders. And then this one is looking at those total transfers. So again, we're counting multiple transfers. A student transfers more than once. And so um, 
UCO is still at the top of the female list. Oklahoma State is still at the top of the male transfer list. So uh, like I said, looking at this cohort, over 3,000 females in this cohort transferred as opposed to over 2,000 males. Um, if you're looking at those total transfers, we've got 10,469 female transfers and 6,905 male transfers. So more women transfer. What's interesting about this math is we don't know for sure, obviously, that every transfer student transfers exactly three times. In fact, we're pretty sure that's obviously not what happens. A lot of students transfer once and that's it. But then that means the students who don't do that transfer more than three times. So lots of, lots of swirling. Okay, so GPA after transfer. What are the success rates of Oklahoma's transfer students? We talk a lot about kind of how well students perform if they've chosen to transfer. Um, so we have a couple of different tables and charts here to show what this looks like. This starting cohort, if you look at that first semester GPA, it's gonna be the same, because this is before anyone has transferred, right? It's their first semester. So the average GPA for this cohort is a 2.68 after the end of that first semester. Um, progression year one, that's comparing it to the next fall semester. Students who stay at the same institution, um, GPA goes up a little bit. Students that stay at an Oklahoma institution, but they transfer, goes down a little bit. And this average cohort GPA is not the average of those two GPAs, it's just everyone who was in this cohort that stayed enrolled in school the next year, whether they transferred or not, what was their GPA? And so you can see, I think it's kind of easier to see on this table here, where Retained student GPAs go up, average ones are higher than those transfer students, and in that progression year one, you see a dip in GPA before you see it rebound. Um, I'll go back to this slide because my analyst who was working on this data point, he noticed that really the transfer student GPAs decline while the retained students GPAs increased. However, that was because the retained students um, those GPAs didn't increase per student, but rather the average GPA for retained students increased because poor performers weren't retained the next year. So those students end up not staying in school. Those would be a dropout or a stopout. So I think that's an important note because at first glance, it's easy for us to look at this and say, oh, students who are retained do so much better academically. Transferring is bad for your GPA. And really we need to account for GPAs of students that might bring down those averages and those students wouldn't be retained in either setting at their original institution or in the state system. Um, Part-time and full-time students, we took a look at the same thing. So you can take a look at full-time on the top, part-time on the bottom. Again, that first semester GPA would be before anyone in this cohort transferred. And you see a similar thing here. Um, full-time students, a really similar trajectory with the ones who are retained, average for that cohort versus that transfer. What's interesting to me is this next slide. This is the only one that looks different where the part-time students, whether they're retained or not, um, really kind of struggle. They don't have that same dip in GPA. In fact, if you take a look at that transfer student, they actually go up a little bit. Um, but being a part-time student, we know that there's fewer hours to factor into that GPA. So if you get a, a D in a five-hour chemistry class and you're only taking you know, nine hours, that's really gonna tank your GPA that semester. So that's a important thing to point out, of course, with the part-time students, transferring or not, and that GPA. Uh, we looked at Pell Grant recipient GPAs, similar information, of course, and you see a similar trend. And then GPA by gender, um, again, looking at male and female students, kind of pulling that out just from this cohort to have that demographic data. Um, female students overall had a slightly higher GPA than male students, and there's more females in this cohort. And so this is the, uh, one of the slides that I think is interesting because we also looked at transfer GPA by the, orig the originating institutional tier. So students could have started at two-year, four-year research, four-year regional, or a four-year private or university. You can see that first semester GPA where it starts. Research has the highest with private college or university behind it, regional being third, community college um, starting with the lowest on that. But then when you see them move, all of them have that same kind of dip in that transfer year and that rebound, with the exception of the two-year schools. That's the one that starts on the bottom here with that 2.43 GPA. It kind of stays flat, progression year one, and then it really improves. And so a lot of those students transfer as part of the plan because they're starting at the two-year school, whereas maybe a student who starts at a Research One school and transfers to a community college maybe didn't set out with that plan and had other reasons that they transferred, whatever they might have been. So. 
I think that's interesting. But okay, let me have um, Dr. Bates come up here. Oh. Yeah, I don't know if we have time. Are there questions? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not, because I did go through the slides pretty quickly for you all. Okay, and here's Dr. Bates to talk about math pathways. All right, well, thank you. Oh, perfect. So, again, you know, we can't make any opportunity um, one where we can't talk about math pathways, right? So you might be thinking, oh, she's back, right? Or more math. Uh, again, it's not exclusively related to transfer, but as we discuss student success um, in the broader math pathways initiative that we're still part of and that we're still uh, embracing at the state regions, we hope that the data is somewhat helpful um, to you at your institutions and as a system. We generally like to utilize the college readiness remediation rates uh, comparatively with our Oklahoma Promise students uh, to the traditional students. Those uh, Oklahoma Promise students, if you have them on your campus, are generally um, high performing. I'm trying to use the right verbs, right? High performing. And what we've seen over the last um, five years, at least on this slide, is, is, the, is the gap between the two um, cohorts, right? It's, it's getting to a point now where we're, at least in 2020, a difference of a tenth of a percent, right? So that gap is closing. And I think that's a really important thing. What we didn't have on here, though, unfortunately, was uh, the COVID years. We are already anticipating what that's going to look like, probably back to um, a much broader um, gap, um, for sure. But hopefully, um, we're, the remediation rates continue to drop. Oh, my goodness. You know, when you put these together, <laughs> you don't think about a room of this size and a TV even as big as that, that you're not going to be able to see these. So uh, I think that we've got some line charts in here as well, right? So that maybe this will be easier to see. But what I will just kind of um, provide verbally to you is, you know, if we look back at 2013 um, as a state system, uh, that, fisc that school year, 2013-2014, uh, we were putting about 31,751 souls into zero level of remediation courses. Just think of that number, 31,000, right? Um, as we've implemented as a state system and as our institutions um, have continued to work uh, to refine their curriculums, as they were refining their placement strategies, as they were um, perhaps implementing multiple measures to better assess student success for those students. Um, if you look at the very tail end of this graph, we're now at 7582. 7582. It's still 7582, but it's not 31,000. Right? So I think that's just uh, really a testament to the work at our institutions. It's a testament to the faculty, um, those that are also involved in the onboarding process, um, depending upon how you as an institution are doing uh, placement and assessment for uh, mathematics. Again, these are all just great outcomes to show that uh, we're, we're moving in the right direction. I do want to make a particular note here too, we're not suggesting, the data is not suggesting that somehow the students are better prepared today than they were in 2013. What we're saying is we've got different metrics and different measures to um, identify where a student will be most successful, right? So again, I think that that's um, something that we definitely want to uh, highlight as well. Whoops, I got pages and I've got a clicker, so too many things up here. All right, so again, apologies for the, for the smallness of the slide. Um, what we have here is just an overview of the four uh, courses that we do offer system-wide, uh, bearing in mind that not all courses or modalities in terms of co-requisites are available at all of our public institutions. Um, so, so transfer students still really are um, needing to take a pause, not, not necessarily a pause, but they really do need to converse with their current institution and their transferring institution. Um, and ideally, as a former math faculty, I would love to say that students are getting their math done before they transfer, right? Um, that's not always the case, right? So um, as we do talk with students, um, many times students say, well, the course didn't transfer or I didn't get credit. Well, you, you will get credit but if it's not an applicable course, so again, if you have a student who for whatever reason would um, decide to take a general education math course, which is really for um, liberal arts majors, but that particular student decides they want to you know, be a STEM major, well, guess what? They've got to take the appropriate course, right? So 
we always try to make sure we tell students, and particularly advisors, that formalize a conversation with students so they understand what a degree plan is. And it's not about um, the courses won't transfer, because as Chris had said earlier, we've got over 8,200 courses on our state matrix for course equivalency. So courses will transfer in our state across institutions. What they won't do, though, is simply replace a course that's on a degree plan, right? So that's a, a big difference. I do want to kind of unpack this slide a little bit, again, just because I know the size is off. But we are now getting into the COVID uh, data. We've talked about this internally as a staff before we presented this today. Forever moving forward, these years will always be asterisk, right? Uh, because there was this mild thing called you know, the global pandemic, right? And so we're just now starting to see uh, the outcomes of that in terms of academic performance. But suffice it to say, again, if I break these down by those uh, four courses, the college algebra COREC, which is in some cases it could be called um, pre-calculus, COREC, at your institution, saw the, the greatest dip. Um, and I'm not necessarily surprised by that when we think about, again, the cohort here would have been um, possibly sophomores, right, during the COVID period. So they were in their algebra two or geometry um, development at that part, that, that uh, particular time of their academic careers. So we did see a little bit of a dip. Um, and I remain very optimistic and hopeful when we look at you know, future years that this will, will rebound uh, because we were at 70% prior to COVID, right? So we saw a little bit of a dip. But if we look at those other three remaining courses, again, the general education math, the math statistics, and then the functions and modeling, we've actually seen tremendous increases in those courses. And what I really want to stress, again, because as a former math uh, faculty member, I don't want folks to say, well, it's because those courses are easy. They're different. The math is different, kind of what, what you were talking about this morning. Maybe the, that, that course doesn't require the pickaxe, but it does require the ropes, right? So there's definitely um, strategies in those courses that are more applicable to the uh, degrees of study. But again, we're seeing tremendous uh, pass rates um, in the general education math stats and the functions and modeling. So we definitely want to you know, see those. And again, this is more of the graphic to kind of show that where we did Anticipate, I anticipated, so I wasn't too surprised by this, but the other three courses are doing uh, very well. Again, another small graph, apologies. Um, I'll just read it to you. Um, I, what I want to really focus on here, again, if we go back to 2014, uh, college algebra, which is now, in some cases, uh, pre-calculus, we're seeing enrollments of about 24,461 back in 2014. So right at that point in the state system where we were implementing the alternative pathways. And now in 2021, 2020, 2021 numbers, um, that's down to 11,129 with an overall pass rate of 72%. Again, that's the, the kind of the COVID bubble right there is where that's at. Um, and you might be thinking, well, why is she saying that the 11,000 number is good when we had so, so many more students before? Well, those other, can I do the math up here with everybody looking at me? The other 13,000, roughly. Um, the other 13,000 students are being placed in those alternative courses, right? Uh, again, it breaks my heart, but I'm, but I'm a realist. Not everybody wants to take calculus. I mean, it's a really fun course, right? But not everybody wants to take it, nor does everybody need it, right? So those other 14,000 students uh, that would have been um, put through um, college algebra are now being put in those other alternative courses. And again, it's to the benefit of that student because they're actually going to be learning mathematics that is actually designed to be applicable to their degree of study. Okay, And I think... That is my last, oh my goodness, like you can read that, right? Um, I believe these are being shared out, and we're even ahead of time, or maybe two minutes ahead of time. Um, but feel free to reach out to Stephanie or myself. If you talk to me, I'm going to talk to you probably for hours, so give yourself some time, because I'll talk to anybody for hours about math <laughs> and the overall success. And I'll maybe even encourage you to uh, take a calculus class. No, just kidding. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bates and Dr. Baird.